As a student in the Carnegie Mellon Energy Science, Technology, and Policy Program, you will take courses that involve you in multidisciplinary project teams. In the ESTP Core Energy courses, you become part of a team to research selected topics and then present results to your fellow students and faculty. What follows are several project team presentations representing a small sample of topics. From chemical and mechanical grid scale energy storage, to hydrogen as an energy carrier, to reducing the energy use associated with disposable food containers. So my group consists of uh, Ahmed, uh, Alex, Robin, Fraser, and myself, Shrikan. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is we'll be giving an introduction to the different forms of energy storage and uh, what options we have currently. Then we'll be doing uh, talking a bit about mechanical energy storage and then a bit about chemical energy and then we'll be comparing them based on cost, uh, the capacities, and which are the better options when in different uh, conditions. Uh, this is basically an economical option when you when the marginal cost of producing that extra unit of electricity to meet demand uh, is higher than the cost of storing that much amount of energy required to produce the electricity to meet the demand. So le these are basically the c current energy storage options that we have. Uh, a ma major one is pumped hydro of course which uh, consists of about 99 percent of uh, current energy storage capacity. Uh, there are other options, promising options like uh, compressed air energy storage. Uh, the hydrogen economy that uh, one of the groups talked about is also uh, in a nascent stage of development and we always have chemical energy storage options like batteries. Uh, uh, liquefied air is comprised basically of liquid nitrogen, oxygen and argon. Uh, as I said, it's a similar, uh, similar concept to compressed air. Uh, there is a, a company that's called Highview Power. That they came across the idea and say, uh, why not make it into energy storage plant? They made a pilot in the United Kingdom, and they found a plant, uh, and they, they found a plant of 300 kilowatt and 2.5 megawatt hour plant, and uh, they attach the uh, liquefied air storage system. So uh, advantages over compressed air and pumped hydro that it uh, requires less infrastructure because we don't we don't need to build as much dams and underground storage. So this liquid air can be stored in tanks above ground. And uh, when we come to the problems of it, uh, we can see that liquefying air is very energy intensive. So as we said, it's about 50 percent efficiency. Um, so moving on from mechanical, we're going to talk about chemical energy storage now. So first, a quick history of um, the chemical energy storage. We're going to cover between Alex and I um, most of these points on the board. Um, batteries have been around for at least 150 years, and uh, there's been slow advancements in the field, but uh, there's also been some recent advancements as well. Um, lithium batteries and flow batteries. Uh, I think people have struggled to name flow batteries because it's really a combination of like a fuel cell and a battery. But you can see that flow batteries, which I'll explain in a second, are um, thought to be a grid storage option that would be on the same time frame as pumped hydro. Um, the difference though is that you have your electrolytic tanks function as like a fuel tank. So you can, um, the amount of charge you can hold isn't dependent on the size of the battery it's dependent on the size of the tank. So these are attractive because you can uh, build more tanks and therefore increase the storage capacity of the battery. So I'm going to be talking about thermochemical storage. This is kind of what the hydrogen economy group was talking about in one of the ways that you can separate hydrogen, but this works on a much larger scale and with, with much more varied um, chemical chemistries. And you generate energy from solar, wind, hydroelectric power. Um, and that power then is used to disassociate any sort of reaction. So it follows a reaction that requires heat input in order to break apart something. In this case, it's uh, ammonia into hydrogen and nitrogen. You can also do it to separate water out of any sort of hydrolyzed atom. Um, you can also do it with like redox reactions. It's got a wide and varied potential. The nice thing, though, is that anything that you're storing 
you put it back together with a catalyst or slightly higher temperatures and they will rapidly reform the original um, chemistry and generate a lot of heat at the same time. So it's an endothermic reaction on the in inside and then an, an exothermic to get power out, which you can then use to generate steam. You can use, if it's in a gaseous form, just to turn a gas turbine, anything like that. It also has a very high storage density because you're probably getting off some sort of liquid and some sort of gas, which have high um, energy potentials, but when they're stored separately, there's no chance for them to recombine or do anything like that. So you're basically storing any energy that you get in put in your storing that you can then get out later. So you'll see that it's broken up into pretty much three groups where it either has very high power but a very long discharge, which is all of your pumped hydro, your compressed air, liquefied air, anything like that. In the middle, you have kind of medium power storage, but you also have a much shorter discharge time. That's all of your batteries, all of your kind of pretty much just batteries. Um, and then at the very low end, you have small power capacity, but a very short discharge time. So these are other batteries, flywheel, stuff like that. And so what we're gonna see coming up is actually a combination of chemical and mechanical storage. So we're gonna use pumped hydro in order to store a lot of energy, but in order to get it out very fast, we might convert it to a flywheel or we'll convert it to a battery and then use that for instantaneous discharge. Good morning. Uh, I would like to start describing the production of hydrogen with thermal processes, <coughs> uh, because in the United States, almost 95% of all hydrogen produced is produced by uh, thermal, uh, thermal processes, particularly by steam reforming of natural gas. And in partial oxidation, the methane or other hydrocarbons are uh, burnt in an oxygen lean environment uh, to produce, again, carbon monoxide and hydrogen in an uh, incomplete combustion process. And this process is, again, followed by water gas shift reaction uh, to produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The advantage of, this, uh, of these thermal processes is that they are highly advanced and uh, well commercialized technologies. That's why the uh, majority of the U.S. Uh, hydrogen demand is supplied by these uh, thermal processes. So I'm going to talk about the hydrogen storage and utilization. But first, I want to introduce several hydrogen storage methods. The method of storing hydrogen is de or determined by the property of it. At the standard temperature and pressure, hydrogen is gas. It has very low density and also very low energy density by volume, which means if you want to store uh, hydrogen with enough energy, you need a huge tank. We want, we want to find new way so we can compress the hydrogen and then store it. This, pressure, this method is called compressed gas storage. And further, we can liquefy the hydrogen and then store, and this method is called liquid hydrogen storage. Hydrogen is that it is very active. Hydrogen is always readily to combine it to other elements. So instead of store pure hydrogen, we can store hydride. So the most popular hydride is metal hydride. The answer is almost everywhere. Hydrogen can use it as a fuel of transportation and also can use it for national defense and it can also be used in industry, for example, to produce fertilizer or make a glass. And of course, they can use it as a backup of power grid, especially for renewable energy like wind. Um, as we all know, hydrogen is not actually a primary energy source, but an energy carrier. If we, if we produce all the hydrogen by fossil fuels, it actually requires three times more energy than it can provide. Hydrogen is not the primary source of energy. It's just an energy carrier, just like electricity. So in order to use hydrogen in our economy, we have to develop the whole supply chain from production to transportation and utilization.
there are a lot of disposable containers used at Carnegie Mellon in different dining locations and in other areas. And there's a lot of energy required to both make these, transport them here, and then also dispose of them afterwards. Um, it's kind of surprising that Carnegie Mellon has so many disposable containers because we are an otherwise really uh, energy conscious location and there are a lot of places around campus that only use disposable containers. So La Prima uses a lot of disposable cups, there are a lot of them just in this room right now, and they are recyclable, uh, but as a study that Srikant will discuss showed, at least a quarter of people never recycle and only a quarter of people always recycle. The rest are sort of like, eh, sometimes. So this is the result uh, given by Hawk and I combined two reports into this table. Another is from a Starbucks analysis. So this one, they have the PET cups here. So if we're just looking at when we're using ceramic reusable cups versus the PET cups, it's just 70 times use you can break even. And if we're using the coated paper cups, like the one provided in La Prima, it will be even a smaller number than the 39 based on the ceramic with uncoated paper. So in the study, Fisher has given us some reasons why he thinks this is going to work. So first reason, he thinks that the Tufts University is green in a certain list. But it's ridiculous that Carnegie Mellon is not among the 15 green schools, so I, I will say that this list is not reliable. Uh, unfortunately, disposable food containers don't receive as much attention as a coffee cup, uh, its ca coffee cup counterparts. We therefore conducted our own uh, life cycle analysis, which we hope will be cited hundreds of times. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, Carnegie Mellon's online economic input-output uh, LCA tool was used for this cradle-to-gate study on the energy and water consumption, which does not take into account the final delivery of the products uh, to the consumer. And here are our findings. Uh, on a per, per container basis, reusable plastic and metal are 13 and 85 times worse than the disposable. Um, but after 300 uses, they more than make compensate for their initial high energy and water costs. So our final recommendation is a two-fold solution. We have both price changes and advertising changes. And also, as the, we found during the study, if we give away reusable containers free of charge, then people 75% of people said they would use those regularly. So we think to giving them away at events like orientation or having an Earth Day event, or also one of the other things we've considered that we want to look into is having a customer loyalty program, where if you get a punch card and you get 20 punches, La Prima gives you a free mug, something like that. If you are interested in a distinctive master's degree in energy from Carnegie Mellon's College of Engineering, or if you want to learn more about the ESTP program, please contact us for information.